We've been working on the Holocaust Rail exhibit for a little over two years, um, from thinking and making notes and making plans and drawing plans and uh, building mock-ups and then ordering equipment lists. And it's finally now within the next uh, week we'll be we'll be wrapping it up. Um, about two years ago, we started having meetings and writing notes and uh, making plans, and then from there we start drawing photographs or drawing drawings of what we wanted to see in the exhibit, uh, building mock-ups, uh, and then finally lists of equipment and starting to actually um, do the work. Um, the car moved into place here in Base Six about a year ago this week. And so that's when we started in earnest building the displays and uh, running the wiring and the, for the lighting and trying to figure out how to make all this work inside uh, a historic, um, what is it, a uh, roundhouse, the, the historic Milwaukee Road roundhouse. Um, we took many, many photographs as you can see. Um, and sometimes we've actually thought that we could tell the whole story with photographs, but I think it's always nice to have some objects for people to look at. And we have video in every single uh, kiosk, which is testimonials from Holocaust survivors about their experience in the, of transport in the cars, their experience as they arrived at camp, uh, life in the camp, um, we have one display that is uh, dedicated to Tolerance Week and Phil and Inga, who are our survivor educators who have been coming to Sioux City since 2005 to talk to kids. They've talked to tens of thousands of Siouxland students since 2005. Inga, unfortunately, is recovering from back surgery and will be unable to come this year. And Phil passed away just before COVID in early 2020. Um, and it's now we're starting to realize that there will be almost no um, survivors who will be able to talk to kids. They're aging out and from now on it will be second generation survivors, that, uh, children of survivors that will be coming to talk to our students. So it was time to do a permanent exhibit here at the Rail Museum and it's been an excellent partnership with the nonprofit the Sioux City Railroad Museum. It's, it was like a match made in heaven. Um, they've been very welcoming and cordial and helpful. Over $50,000 worth of labor um, by the staff and volunteers of the Sioux City Railroad Museum is what it took to clean this bay out and prepare it for our exhibit and then to unload the rail car when it came to, from California and to load it again into Bay 6 when it was time. So they've been incredibly cooperative. Um, I, we just couldn't ask for a better partner. Um, it seems like a match made in heaven, and it really is. Uh, we're so excited for kids to have the opportunity to see and feel and touch. The inside of the rail car has uh, sound effects and motion effects to give um, students and families the feeling that the car is moving. Uh, we ask them to imagine a car with 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 people inside. Um, in most cases, they were unable to sit, so they were standing. Um, survivors told us that because of modesty, they sort of self-segregated into men on one side, women on the other. Um, there were no facilities. In most cases, there was no food. Um, unless they were heading to a work camp and then they sometimes fed they sometimes fed the, the prisoners because they wanted them to be healthy enough to work once they arrived at the camp. Um, we, also, we also touch on, well more than touch on, we, we feature Vernon Tott. Um, I think Earl, you're familiar with Vernon Tott. Our first, uh, our first full week of events for Tolerance Week in 2007 premiered uh, the film about Ver Vernon Tott which is called Angel of Alam. He liberated a small camp, and this is a Sioux City veteran we're talking about. He liberated the camp of Alam 
and took photographs of the prisoners. And those photographs are displayed on the wall on two sides of the, of the museum. Late in life, he started identifying the prisoners in his uh, photographs and was able to identify 17 of them before he died. So one whole display is about Vernon Tott um, because that's our Sioux City connection. Uh, one of the displays is uh, coming to America. People that survived had horrible decisions to make after the war because they had no homes to go back to. One gentleman said that Germany was a cemetery to him and there was no reason for him to go back. He was the only member of his family to survive, including his he lost it, it, all of his family, family members, including his wife and two small children. Um, we were able to acquire, through a generous donation by her daughters, the traveling trunks of a survivor who was actually on Schindler's List. And she came to uh, America in 1950 because it took her five years to have a healthy chest x-ray. She had um, polio, not polio, tuberculosis and she was unable to they would not let her get on a ship to come to the United States until she had a clear x-ray so she came in 1950 um, wanting to marry uh, an American because she thought she would be able to put her experiences behind her and she said of course that didn't work but this survivor Lori Smith she never spoke to students she wasn't she wasn't comfortable enough to talk to students but in, she did a four-hour Shoah interview in the late 90s, and she was beautiful and articulate, and we are using a great deal of her testimony. So her daughters donated the trunks, and they are very happy with the idea that their mother will be involved in Holocaust education for the foreseeable future, even though she has passed away and did not really want to do that when she was alive. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderfully satisfying for for those daughters to be able to do that for their mother. Um, we have an exhibit on the experiences of Sioux City, members of the Sioux City community who had, who were survivors or uh, offspring of survivors. At the present, there are six survivors uh, featured and we have testimony from some of them and then interviews with some of their children. So we kind of anticipate that exhibit will grow as people sort of come forward and say, well, you know, my grandfather, or you know, so we anticipate that will grow and so that will be an ever-changing exhibit. Um, when you come into the exhibit, we sort of glossed over that, you actually find yourself in pre-war Germany. You see the propaganda posters on the poles. Uh, we'll listen to the experiences of how, how some of our interviewees uh, experienced things changing, um, rights being taken away, they were told, Jews were told where they could sit, where they could go to school, what jobs they could have. Um, and then eventually they were told to wear a yellow star. Eventually they were put in ghettos in many cities and, and uh, transported to the camps. Um, we'll see the, the orders that Inga Auerbacher's family received. They got their orders to appear at the rail yard to, to go to Terrazin. And that was when her world completely was shattered. Um, inside the car you'll see you'll see photographs that represent drawings of what it might have been like to be inside a car. Some of those drawings were done before the end of World War II by a German artist. 